With the Music Ain't Loud Enough album, you also had a lot of the interludes, uh, you know, Cool and the Godfather. Uh, you had to with Flavor Flav. So what gave you the idea to where it was kind of like you talking, you were sampling them or what have you, but then to make it out like you were actually speaking with them? Um, <laughs> that's what it sounded like it should go. That's the way it sounded like it should have went to me. I just had this. Like back then, and I and 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 I guess you know sometimes I still feel that creative. Uh, some days when I get up, you know what I mean. Um, that's just that's just what it sounded like to me. I, when I heard that, I was like, "Huh." Okay. What I'll do with that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Just Fair be as creative as possible, and be as, as different as possible at the time. Right. And you also made a point that you were going to have a party album, but with messages. So was that purely from Public Enemy or was that just something that's important to you as a person? Uh, the second part of your question. Yes, there's something that's important to me. You know, what I mean, I want the people I want people to see a different side of me. You know, uh, the general public always sees DJ cool, you know, push it up, push it up, you know, <laughs> hold up, wait a minute, all that all kind of stuff. But when you get a chance to talk to me. Um, now you can see the real side of me, you know what I mean, which is uh, a very socially conscious person, uh, somebody that cares about others, you know what I mean, and all that humanitarian stuff, you know what I mean? Okay. Man, you know, like basically giving a damn about all the things that's really going on in the world. And is that something that your parents instilled in you or you learned growing up in D.C.? Like, where does that come from, do you think? Uh, a little bit of both. First and foremost, my parents, my mother and my father, may both of them rest in peace. Like, they just, you know, put those real strong morals in me, you know what I mean? Made sure that I was a god fearing person, knew who and what the entity of God is and spirituality and all that stuff that goes along with that, you know what I mean? And... Um, I'm thankful for the for the upbringing that they gave me and 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 uh I don't know I guess for lack of a better term they made me the person that I am today. So um all that stuff that you heard and all those little interludes and everything that was once again just showing the real side of who DJ Cool really is as a person, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or an additional side. <laughs> yeah. Cuz I think it's all all the above. But that was one of the many things as a kid, you know, and especially when this album was coming out, the music ain't loud enough. 1990, man, like D.C. in particular was unfortunately, like Chuck Brown said, it wasn't Dodge City, but it it was uh, it did stand for Dodge City, sadly, in reality. And I wanted to get from you because on like a song like I Can Make You Dance, you still were putting in there, even though it's a dance party record. You were talking about like not not doing the pipe and not all this stuff that was so pervasive in our area. So how or why did you uh, want to put that in a party record? Maybe people are like, they just want to dance like they did on Music Ain't Loud Enough. But here you are talking about don't do drugs, you know, at the same time. It's like now I got your attention. Let me tell you this. You understand? While I have your attention, let me tell you this. And so you just proved that somebody heard what I said. Oh, I definitely did. <laughs> and, and for a lot of people, that might even been, for all I know, it could have been a life-changing moment for some folks. Yeah. Well, see, this is one of the reasons why the music ain't loud enough is such an amazing album to me, because it had so many different sonic styles. Musically, you got the reggae, you got the house, you got the go-go, you got the hip-hop. But and we'll get to pressed against the glass in a minute. Um, but I also thought it was then you were sliding into Marcus Garvey, too. So I was like, so it was like such a journey to go on all, all these different things. Um, I was just always like blown away and how, the house music, too, even though that was uh, obviously much bigger in Baltimore than in D.C. Um, so with the house music in particular, and since hip hop was so big, of course, Jungle Brothers in particular, Doug Lazy, many, many others. Why do you think the hip house didn't stay, stay around longer? 
the house thing, shout out to Sam Burns, rest in peace, was more underground here in D.C. D.C. had had a house music scene, you know what I'm saying? Shout out to uh, uh, the House Nation, you know what I mean? And they, they know who they are. And but but it was more so an underground thing. Uh, but you could go to clubs like um, uh, Chapter Three slash Mirage. Shout out to Ron Hunt and all of those folks from back then. And uh, the House Nation would be there and they're strong. But the thing the thing with the house, well, let's say a club like uh, Mirage, the DJs in they playing a little bit of everything. You know what I mean? So they could set up there and get into a strong house music set. And get it off, you know what I mean? Because the house nation is there, you know what I mean? Um, uh, but once again, I think house is more so underground here. Uh, musically, live music has always taken center stage here, you know what I mean? And not just go go. Even before go go, it was, was R and B and funk music, you know what right. I mean? And then with the inception of go go, you know, made Chuck Brown rest in peace, and you know, thank you for all your contributions that you've made uh in uh creating the culture uh, of gogo um um i'm almost losing my train of thought here a little bit but at the end of the day um gogo being more prevalent so i guess how can i say this if you had a pecking order as far as music is concerned this is probably the best way i can sum it up gogo is definitely going to be first here and you know second and second and third. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So then in fourth place, you're going to have DJs and hip hop music. And then, you know, uh, even more underground, which would be house music. And reggae was somewhere in there. You know what I mean? It's like DC, like musically, we seem to go through these little phases and whatnot. Because when the hip hop thing, a hip house thing, or the house music thing got popular here, that's when you get people like Doug Lazy coming out of DC and you know and all of these folks doing the hip hop the hip house thing. And then we had our little reggae phase and when that was shopping rank got hot and all of these caps. So, so then you get groups like Born Americans, shout out to them. They are great and they they will remain great in my opinion. You know what I mean? Uh, so DC seems to always go through these little music phases and whatnot, other than with, with go-go music. And, and back to Gogo for a second, I got a little ahead of myself, but with Rare Essence and we go on and on uh, back in the day, what what was happening with you to where you weren't doing more Gogo recordings, like just a ton of them? What was happening? Um, I don't know, man. I was <laughs> I was on the road a lot. You know what I mean? Um, and. Uh, that's probably what it was, basically. And then I had gotten myself in a situation where I was in between labels. Like 1992 um, was the end of my situation with Creative Funk. And then I started a new situation. Shout out to Steve Janis out of Baltimore, Maryland. And uh, I was with a label called CFM Records. And that's when you had songs like 20 Minute Workout, I Got That Feeling, and then The Bomb Clear My Throat. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. We got to get, got to get to all that. But with, um, uh, back to music ain't loud enough for a second with, uh, pressed against the glass. One thing I was always intrigued about was, uh, uh, naming Rostine Murray, like naming your girlfriend and, and stuff. Uh, at the time. <laughs> at the time. well, I mean, at the time, of course, but since that was like very, very, that was very unusual step. I think to name the name, uh, like this, is my girl. So what, uh, why, why do you, in retrospect, why did you do that? Uh, in love, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. Nose wide open, you know, all that. Uh, and in my head, you know, that was going to, in my head, that was going to be my future wife, but things just didn't work out. So it is what it is. Okay. God Fair bless enough. her. She's around here somewhere. I haven't seen her in Eon. Okay. But well, God bless her. Peace. <laughs> yes. Now, with Pressed Against the Glass 2, two other things in particular I always thought were in interesting was with the... Because you sampled so much and used so many powerful samples with the Boogie Down Productions had Why Is That, which used a similar piano sample and all that. So... 
for you as a DJ, as a songwriter, as a producer, when you're using a sample in a different way off a song that's so prominent, how how do you try to get something different out of it lyrically or stylistically? Uh, I don't know. I guess I just put my head in a in a different position, you know what I mean, so to speak. Um, because I don't want it to be this. I'm a I want it to be this, you know what I mean? So let me just kind of shift gears a little bit here, put some other little spices on top of it and basically turn it into something else. You know mm. what I mean? But I still wanted it to have a particular type of feeling too. You know what I mean? So and shout out to DJ Renegade. Um the poem that I it was a poem that I was reciting, uh, 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 the lyrics uh, from that song. It was um he was a performance poet. As a matter of fact, he used to be a DJ partner of mine, he used to work with me down at the east side. And um he wrote this book of poetry. And he said, cool, man, I got, I got this book, man. I want you to have it, blah, blah, blah. So I'm reading, I'm reading through everything. And I heard, I seen this poem. I'm like, yo, that's dope. So I told him I wanted to use it for the song. He's like, man, go ahead. Do whatever you want. And so that's pretty much how the idea of that song came about. And then, you know, because the guy was in love at the time. <laughs> that's how that came about. And now, mind you, you never hear another song like that ever again. Period. That was a one and done situation. Yes. Period. I just don't want to get into that part of my life publicly ever again. You know what I mean? I noticed that. But I also noticed, too, uh, uh, on another thing I never heard you talk about again, but I also thought was interesting in me being uh, relatively or pretty young at the time uh, that you were talking about the bike, like how you wanted the bike and stuff, because I think I always find it interesting when uh in in rap in particular when artists explore something that's a little bit different and like obviously in 1990 people talking about how they looked wanted a bike wasn't a, a normal thing but what 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 made that so powerful to you to want to include it i mean it was the poem i mean what you heard <clears throat> the lyrics that i were uh, that i was reciting that was the actual poem that he wrote and okay. when i heard i was like that dope right there like that kind of reminds me of somebody really wanting to be with somebody or somebody really wanting something and they did just like i'm so close i could touch it i could taste it but i just cannot get a hold of it you know what i mean for some reason uh, this particular thing or situation or what have you keeps escaping me and i'm just up here pressed against the glass just looking at it like wow i would love to you know what i mean so that was the whole vibe behind that behind that piece and um, when I read that, I was like, "Yo, that's that's dope. I need to, I need to, I need to build a song around that." And uh, the creator was like, "Okay, boom, there you go. <laughs> this, we're gonna call this Press Against the Glass,' which was the title of the poem." Gotcha. Okay. Now I understand a little bit better. So there. So thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. And then. Uh, like you were said, moving on as you get to the 20 minute workout, I guess that would be an EP probably. But uh, mm -hmm. but what was uh, what made Creative Funk? What made you guys separate? We were just done. Oh. <laughs> he couldn't take me no further. Okay. You know what I mean? He couldn't. Um, he was trying to get me signed to different label situations and i don't think a lot of people understood what i was doing at the time i think i was a little ahead of the curve the way i'm mixing this hip-hop and go-go stuff you know and whatnot and, and making these records stick you know what i mean um excuse me i want to rewind the tape a little bit back to something or someone that you mentioned earlier uh by the name of herbie lovebug herbie lovebug told me this herbie lovebug brother told me this one night at the capitol center we were all together doing a show, and uh, Herbie came to my dressing room, along with a lot of others. I introduced myself, and he was like, yeah, I know exactly who you are. He said, you are the reason why I made the records that I made with Salt and Pepper, Kid and Play, uh, who's a Sweet Tea, all those go-go, you know, influence records. He said, because I heard the way that you were making records. And I also got a chance to spend some time in D.C. And I heard, I forgot what band he said that he heard before. I'm thinking around that time it must have been Trouble Funk because they were very prevalent. 
at that time. You know what I mean? Like Trouble Funk was running the game that time in the 80s. And Joker told me that in my face. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. So, yeah, that's impressive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It worked out well for him, that's for sure. For both yeah, of you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he, he had a better situation than I had as far as uh, uh, a label situation is concerned. Yeah, but um, that, that ended up working out. Now, when uh, at this point, though, you've got singles out, you got an album out, you've done well, you're going to be on a new label. So, was the transition uh, before now that you've had the success? Uh, did it just take you a while to, to make new music or were you sitting on all these ideas or what was happening to you mentally? It was probably a little bit of both. You know what I mean? I'm like, OK, I'm getting ready to shift gears uh, and see what I could do with these folks and maybe get a little bit closer to getting an opportunity to being an artist on a major or at least major independent situation. Um, and so I was I guess I was just kind of getting my thoughts together. You know okay. what I mean? But I had tons of ideas. Like my head, like I'm spinning with ideas right now as we speak. Because right? <laughs> I'm in my studio and everything. It's where I, it's where that's some of the stuff. But anyway, um, um, that's what it was, man. It, it, it was just, uh, for lack of a better term, just shifting gears. You know what I mean? And getting okay. ready to see what this new situation is, 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 uh, uh, is going to be all about. Okay. And then with your recording, like with 20 Minute Workout, we recorded it live, the version that's on the album, 20 mm -hmm. Minute Workout. But where did you ever explore in this time or or really much at all? Because, of course, you've done recordings with Go-Go artists. But did you ever think of, like, I'm going to do a album with Wear Essence, with Trouble Funk, with Hot Cold Sweat, with EU, whoever? And if not, why not? Um, I guess it's because... I don't know, maybe at the time, like, I feel like I'm going this way and they're going in a different direction or what have you, or I'm just moving too fast, or, I don't know. I've always wanted to make songs um, with certain groups, uh, mo for the most part, rare essence, you know what I mean? Like, that's that's my squad. Um, but I don't like coming to people if I don't have a complete idea. You know what I mean? If I don't have like the whole song already formatted in my head, I don't want to come to you and say, yo, man, I, you know, I want to do something. You know, right, well, what you want to do? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to come like that. When I come, I've already got the whole song put together in my head. And I'm like, look, when, when can we go in and knock this out? That's how I am. Okay. Makes sense. And I don't want to waste my time or anybody else's time. You know what I mean? Hmm. Now, I remember uh, when I got 20-Minute Workout, the, the album, EP, what have you, I was uh, so shocked, somewhat similar to uh, Let Me Clear My Throat later, but you recorded it in Virginia. So I noticed a lot of your big songs, they're not recorded in D.C. or even in Maryland. So why, why do you record them outside of the home, home area? Uh, first and foremost, 20-Minute Workout was, you're right. It was recorded in Richmond, Virginia. It was recorded live. I mean, really live. Uh, not studio live, as I like to call it, but live live. Um, because I was working at this particular club at a time. Shout out to uh, all the good folks down there that used to rock with me at Ivory's Uptown Lounge in Richmond, Virginia. Shout out to Steve Branch, who was the owner of the club at that time. And 20 Minute Workout was basically <clears throat> a routine I used to do in the club that I started doing here when I was working at clubs like the Ibex and Triples and stuff like that. So when I went to Richmond, Virginia and started working at Ivory's, I was doing the Tuesday night, which was a, a huge college night uh, situation that I had going on down there. I just kind of brought the routine down there. All the people down there was crazy about it. I said, well, you know what? One night I'm gonna record this live at this club. I made the announcement uh, probably a week prior to the recording. The next week, people come in there. I had the situation set up, the mobile uh, recording situation set up in there. I had place mic'd up, this and that. And what I was doing was I had two copies of Dougie Fresh. I'm getting ready. And I'm just cutting the record back and forth while I got the mic in front of me, just doing the routine like I do every night. The only difference is we're recording this live. So if you notice, 
when you hear me shout out all these places, is DC in the house, is New York in the house? Well, I'm just saying, you know, I'm recognizing the people that are from these different places in the club. But if you notice the response that I got, and I got good responses, but when you heard the response I got when I say, is Virginia in the house? Oh, that's, that's when it exploded because obviously I'm in Virginia, in Richmond. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. So that was, uh, I guess Virginia State would have been big at that club, I guess, probably. Well, you got, well, that was one of the places. Um, Ivory sat right behind uh, VCU. VCU, well, VCU was right behind Ivory. And then down the street, probably about five minutes south of Ivory uh, was Virginia Union. And then 20 minutes south, I meant to say 20 minutes south in Petersburg, Virginia, was Virginia State. Okay. Yeah. And then what I, I was always curious, was some of that from uh, Blowfly? Did you get the uh, 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 was that from Blowfly at all or no? No, all that uh, 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 that is from the Jetsons. Eat, ah, or ah, ah. That <laughs> means I, you. I just use the same little rhythm or what have you, or the same little, yeah. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. A 19, I got a fifty thousand dollar car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. It would be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV back for that WA? Yo MTV is just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.